Hello Seminole High School students and Miss Harkin's class. I hope that you are enjoying reading uh, or having read to you Heir Apparent. Uh, this is Vivian Vandeveld and I am here to answer some of the questions that you have. Um, okay, so we are talking about Heir Apparent. This is the hardcover. This is the paperback. This is the newer paperback. I do have to say that I very much prefer the original picture to the new one. And I'll talk a little bit later about why they why they changed that. But meanwhile, let me get to your questions. Okay. Uh, Rondell asked, what education would you recommend to be an author? Um, there isn't any special education to be an author the way... Sorry, that's the cuckoo clock. Um, there isn't um, a special school that you go to the way to become a doctor you need to go to medical school to be a lawyer you need to go to law school even to be a, a truck driver you need to, to have special training with being an author I would say that you need to be educated so that you can speak well um, and write well um, but you don't need to, there, there are special programs um, to teach you writing, but I would recommend rather than, or in addition to doing that, what is best is to read a lot. Um, the more you read, the more that becomes part of your subconscious. So if you're reading something or even watching something on TV, uh, or a movie, analyze what's working and what isn't for you. Um, if, if you're saying, I immediately like this character or trust this character, stop and think, what is it that the author has done to make you feel that way? And the fact that there's a cute actor playing the role or that there's a cute um, picture on the cover, that doesn't count. What in the words make you like and trust, or the opposite way, make you dislike and distrust a character? Uh, another thing that, that you can do is to figure out when are you getting bored in the story, and if there is, in your opinion, too much description, what would you cut out and yet still make the story make sense for a reader so that they can be able to picture what's going on um, or, or understand the motivations of the characters. A lot of times when you see a spooky movie, there will be, usually it's a girl, alone in a house and she hears a spooky noise in the basement and she says, Oh, I think I'll see what's down in the basement. And you're saying to yourself, don't go in the basement. But she always goes down in the basement to investigate that spooky sound. And as a writer, what you can do is say, okay, so I don't think that it makes sense for her to go down in the basement. I wouldn't go down in the basement. My friends wouldn't be silly enough to go down in the basement. What could you have that character do that would make more sense to you and still keep the story moving forward. Uh, so she might decide, okay, so I'm alone in the house and there's somebody or something in the basement. Maybe I will lock myself in the bedroom and barricade the door and hope that whatever's in the basement can't get through that barricade or seep under the door or, or in some other way get to me. And you might think, well, okay, so that isn't going to work. Maybe she needs to leave the house. Because we're assuming, of course, that the phones don't work. Um, so she needs to leave the house. So you don't want to make things too easy for the character. So you might say to yourself, okay, what if the closest house to her is way over there? And not only is it way over there, but she needs to cross through a cemetery to get to that house what would happen then. So look at stories and analyze what makes it work for you, what makes it not work, and how would you try to solve that problem. Um, Riley asked, was there a moment in your life that made you become an author? Um, 
No, there wasn't one particular moment. I always enjoyed stories. Um, from the time that I was <clears throat> a real little girl, I would read a book or I would see a movie and I'd say, that was really good. You know what would make it better? And I might change the ending or I might put more characters or fewer characters. I really enjoyed Disney movies um, growing up. I still enjoyed them. Um, <clears throat> my daughter and I tend to sing along to the DVDs and my husband leaves the room like that because we are terrible singers. Um, but the problem that I had with the Disney movies was that the Disney princesses looked so much different from me. Um, they had beautiful hair. Um, they could sing. They could dance. They were friends with the forest creatures. So I loved the magic. Um, I loved the stories, but I wanted the characters to be a little bit more like me. So I had a tendency to put myself into um, other stories that I was either seeing or reading. And that's something that, that you might try doing. What was the first book you wrote? Um, that was from Joey. Uh, how old were you when you wrote it? That was from Amber. And how long to get it published from Ms. Harkins? Okay, so the first book was called A Hidden Magic. And it was about a princess who did not look like the Disney princesses. And there is a prince that she meets that that's not the prince. Oops, where is it? There he is. Uh, that's not the prince. That's that's a different character. But she meets a prince who's very handsome, but he's quite arrogant and he gets himself into trouble and she needs to rescue him. So that was an idea that I had, again, from loving the Disney stories, but wanting the characters to be a little bit more like me. So this main character, this princess, um, is a little bit shy. She's a little bit overweight. She um, is not, she is not your typical Disney princess. And so I, I started writing the story and it was a little bit harder to write than I thought it was going to be because I, there, there wasn't a teacher or a, uh, an editor who was saying, write this. It was just something that I wanted to do. And it was hard for me to figure out what should happen next. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to write that. that. That's too hard work. And said I would read a book because that was easier to do. Or I might go out with my friends. Or I might knit a sweater because that, that's something else that I enjoy doing. But once I had started the story, it was almost as though the characters started calling me and saying, you got us into the woods, you got us into trouble, what's going to happen next? And so I kept going back to the story and I would write a little bit more and then I would write myself into a corner and I'd say, okay, I'm putting this aside. Um, and so it, and, until the next point that, that I started, picked up the, the, the manuscript and, and, and restarted on it. Um, so it took me about two years to write the story. Um, I was 28, by the way, at the time that, that uh, I wrote it. And two years to write the story, and then I started submitting it to editors. And the editors were not liking the story as, as well as I did and, and as well as my mother did. And they would send it back to me. And then I would say, well, that's a disappointment, but I would send it out again. And it took two years while I was sending the story out and getting it back again. Actually, that's that's a fast turnaround time now because uh, I was 28 a good many years ago. And uh, so uh, that uh, process has, has kind of slowed down now. The advent of computers has made um, writing and publishing um, easier in some ways, uh, but because it is easier, then uh, editors are getting more manuscripts and things have slowed down a lot. Uh, but in any case, it took two years to get it published. 32 uh, publishers said no before number 33 said yes. And the one that said yes um, said we have a particular uh, illustrator in mind, Trina Shard Hyman. She had just won the Caldecott for best drawings um, in, in a children's book for George and the Dragon. And so a lot of people were asking her to do their uh, books and uh, she said yes that she would do mine but it took her two years to get to me 
um, who had joined to end up the line. I am very pleased with the way she drew the characters. Um, but it, all in all, it took six years from the time that I said, oh, I have an idea, and I think that that would make a good book to actually having it be a book that someone could hold in their hands. Um, other books of mine have not been rejected 32 times. Some of them have been accepted the very first time that, uh, that I've sent it out. Um, it's never taken that many times to, um, to have a book rejected uh, since then. Uh, so it, it's easy to give up um, on writing when you get told no so often, um, but I did not give up. Okay, um, what was your inspiration uh, for writing Heir Apparent? There's, there's a whole cluster of questions here that, that all were kind of similar um, or that I'll be talking about at the same time. Uh, so what was your inspiration for writing Heir Apparent? Apparently numerous students asked that. Uh, there were several strands um, several ideas that, that bounced around in my head all at the same time to make this book come out. The first was that I had a meeting with my editor in New York and I had actually, I was between projects. I had finished something uh, that I was working on and hadn't started something else. Um, but my editor said to me, so what are you working on now? This is like your teacher asking, so how are you getting on with the project that I've given you? Uh, I didn't want to admit that I didn't have a project. So I said, well, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a sequel to Air, I'm sorry, to User Unfriendly. And the reason that I said that was because at that point, for each of my books, someone had said, I think you need to write a sequel to that, except for user unfriendly. Nobody had asked for a sequel to user unfriendly, and being kind of a contrary kind of person, I decided that was the one that I wanted to uh, to write a sequel to. Uh, by the way, this is user unfriendly the way it appeared in hardcover. Uh, the way it appeared in first paperback. And the way it appeared in the more recent paperback. So this editor, who was my editor for User Unfriendly, said, yeah, User Unfriendly? And because he didn't sound too enthusiastic, that kind of redoubled my idea that, yes, that was, that was a story I wanted to work on. Um, someone else, uh, Kai. Kai asked, what was your intention for showing Janine's frustrations being stuck in the game? And uh, Chloe mentioned, Ms. Harkins said you admitted to not being very good with technology. Same with her. Uh, what made you come up with a book about technology and in the future? Um, so th those two things are related to how I came to write the story. I love to play computer games. I am not very good at them because I am not technologically proficient. Um, and so I wanted to write a story that captured some of my frustrations when I was trying to play a game that was a very complicated uh, game that was supposed to be, you know, hours of enjoyment and hundreds of puzzles and different worlds to explore. And, and yeah, I was stuck at the very beginning because I was obviously missing some important thing that I was supposed to be doing and, and had, had not figured that out yet. So I wanted to capture some of that frustration. Um, yet if it was just a story about a girl or anybody uh, playing a game, so what? Uh, that, that's not important. I had to make what was going on in real life and in the game be connected. Um, so I decided that I wanted it to be a futuristic kind of game um, where it was one step beyond virtual reality. And uh, you could actually have the sensations of being in the game. Uh, again, that, that's just a, a gimmick. Um, so what if she wins or loses the game? So I had to have the game somehow or other be damaged. And that 
comes in with um, the person, let's see, Peyton, who asked, was any of heir apparent based on real life? Yeah, about that same time, I was invited to speak at a school. Uh, this was an elementary school. Um, I have books that are appropriate for, let's say, grades kindergarten on up. Um, some people at the school, uh, some, a parent um, started complaining and other people joined her that they did not like the fact that I wrote fantasy stories. And they said some of them were too spooky for their kids. Now, obviously, I have the sense not to be talking to kindergarten kids about a really spooky ghost story or uh, let, let me tell you about my vampire story. You know, I, I have books that are appropriate for each grade level and I would have targeted, as, as I have in the past, um, different grade levels with different books that I would talk about. Um, but she did not like that I was writing about fantasy or the occult and talked to the district supervisor who ended up canceling my visit um, on Friday, and I was supposed to be there on Monday. Um, and so that idea of parents or anyone trying to protect their children from um, fantasy, I, I recognize that they're trying to do what's good, they think is good for their kids, but I thought that this was a silly concern, and so I made up the organization CPAC, Citizens to Protect Our Children, um, who also think that, that fantasy is a dangerous thing, and I made them damage the equipment. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. So Cameron had asked what is special to you about the book, and what's special to me is that it was my way of saying, yes, fantasy is not dangerous. Uh, fantasy can help you deal with things in, in your real life the way uh, Janine does. Um, and Haley asked, what inspired you to give her three brothers and no sisters? And that was the yet another strand um, of what went into making this story. Um, in the 1100s, uh, King Henry II had um, several sons, and uh, they were fighting amongst each other to, uh, to be named the person who would succeed uh, Henry after he died. And because in past times that could only be a man, not a woman, uh, that was the reason that I gave Janine three brothers and no sister, um, because she needed to, um, to succeed, even though she was a girl, in a scenario where normally she would not be the chosen one. And Zach asks, how did I come up with the name Heir Apparent for the video game and the book? Um, so I, the, looking up um, in, in, in a dictionary, an Heir Apparent is a person who is first in the line of succession and cannot be displaced from inheriting by the birth of another person. Uh, so that's, that's who Janine is. She was the choice of the king. He's been named. She was named by the king. Uh, the king did not want any of his sons taking over, um, and that made her heir apparent. Um, on reflection, I realized that it is a little bit of a difficult title because not everybody in the democracy that is the United States uh, is familiar with the term heir apparent. Okay, uh, why did you choose a 14-year-old girl with daddy issues? Uh, apparently several students' questions were combined for this one, uh, including Jesse and Farah. Um, again, it needed to be a girl because I wanted her to be different from the sons, uh, and because in um, user unfriendly, that was told from a boy's point of view, I wanted to 
to switch to a girl. Uh, why did she have daddy issues? Um, she did because I wanted her to be stuck early in the game when she, with her own father, did not have a good relationship. She did not want to meet her father in the game uh, and that that would cause her troubles. Uh, how long did writing Heir Apparent take? That was from Alyssa, Jeremiah, and Savannah. Uh, probably about six months to um, from the time that I told my editor, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a sequel to User and Friendly, to the time that I sent the manuscript in to him. And then, of course, there was a lot of back and forth as um, he worked on editing the the manuscript. An editor is a lot like your teacher. Your teacher for each one of you will look at what you've written and try to encourage you in ways to make it better by asking questions. Is this the best possible place to begin the story? Could you have a little bit more description here, a little bit less description? Um, that sort of thing. The thing is, if, if you're writing just for yourself, you don't need an editor, you don't need a teacher. But once you start writing to share with other people, then they start having questions. Uh, they start saying, I don't understand. Um, or they think they understand, but they're understanding something totally wrong from, from your intention. Uh, so the editor uh, stands kind of between the ideas that I have in my head and the people who will be reading the story and tries to encourage me in ways to get me to write so that the biggest number of people can understand the story. Um, how many rough drafts did you have? That was a question from Bianca. Um, and Liana also asked, what is your writing process? So those are, those are a little bit connected. Not a specific number of drafts. When I start writing, I write the beginning. Uh, the next day, I will reread the beginning and change a little bit of that and then keep on moving. The next day, I will go back, reread what I have so far, make some more changes, keep on going. So the very first part of the story gets revised a lot, a lot, a lot. And that's important because the first part of the story is what hopefully will hook you into wanting to read more of the story. Um, Whereas once I know what I'm doing and I, and I get on a roll, then yes, I do need to revise that. Uh, but I don't say I will write five drafts or ten drafts or any number of drafts because of the way that I work, which is very often knowing the beginning, knowing the end, but not knowing exactly how I'm going to get there. And I know that that's different from the way other people write. Some people will encourage you to keep on reading, uh, keep on writing without revising. Um, just get it down on paper. Um, that is not the way I work uh, because a lot of times some of the specifics that I come up with the second or third time that I've read a particular uh, scene might change and that opens up whole new possibilities that I hadn't even thought of uh, when I when I first started. Uh, any challenges in writing Air Apparent? That was from Emma. Uh, the big challenge was because Janine keeps going back to the beginning to try to write and capture her frustration about going back to the beginning without repeating myself and making you bored. Um, so she talks faster and faster about that opening um, each time she goes through it and she tries different things and so that makes what happens afterwards um, and, and a way to probably ends up getting killed, um, at least for the, the beginning of the stories, um, each, each one of those different so it doesn't become um, repetitive and, and make you bored. How do you relate to our protagonist, Janine? Um, that was asked by Kathy, Sahira, and Kale. And Nat also asked, is there any connection with any character in yourself. And yeah, I would say that I feel most connected to Janine, who is the viewpoint character. Um, what I admire about her is that she doesn't give up. 
at a point that I probably would have said, okay, you know, well, never mind. It, my, my brain will melt if I don't get disconnected. Yeah, it, it's, it's going to happen because I can't think of anything more that I can do. So she doesn't give up. What a writer can do is make a character smarter um, than she herself is by knowing what's going to happen and to make her more quick-witted. In the case of Janine, she's very sarcastic. And I have a lot of time to think about how she's going to respond to characters. You know, if somebody says something nasty to me, about two hours later I'm going, oh yeah, you know what I should have said, uh, but by then it's too late because that person is gone and, and the situation has changed. Um, but when I'm writing, I can work on exactly what the first person should say and, and how she would respond and, um, and make her seem smarter and wittier um, and more successful than I am. Um, I was asked by um, Janae Unique, uh, Gabriel, and Ms. Harkins um, how I came up with the name Janine, um, and they recognized that the two spellings of her name with a G or with a J, um, but it's the same name. A lot of times when I'm writing a story, I have a book of baby names, um, which says where that name came from and what it means. Uh, names are very important. Um, in this particular case, Janine means God is merciful. That was not so important to me, the meaning. Um, for this particular story, what I wanted was a name that had two different spellings. With the G is uh, more the Italian way, with the J is the old fashioned English way. Um, so I, I thought that that was a good thing. When I'm writing a story, I want the characters all to have distinctive names. If you are in a classroom situation, you can have an Emma and two Emily's, and you know, you might be Emily G and Emily T. Um, but when, when you're reading a story, that Emma and those Emily's, that, that would, or Emmeline, or, you know, names that are too similar would end up confusing you. So I need to think up a bunch of names that are distinct enough from each other that you don't get confused. And in some cases, specifically thinking about what the meaning of the name is, um, especially something that is set in old times. Uh, and even though Heir Apparent is actually set in the future, um, the story that she is playing out is set in old times and people at that time would not be traveling so much. Um, so again, I'm, I'm reading all of your beautiful names and, and some of them come from um, all sorts of different uh, backgrounds, and, and some are ones maybe that your, your that your parents made up that would not have happened in medieval times, where usually someone was born in one village and and stayed in that village their entire life. Um, so Kastner asked, uh, "How did you come up with such a plethora of names?" Which I started to answer without. Um, reading the question out loud. Um, I also want to say when an author makes up names, and, and some of the names in Heir Apparent are made up, uh, when an author makes up names, she has no business complaining about how anybody thinks that name is pronounced. Um, so I would I would never, never do that and uh, welcome you to pronounce the names however seems likely to you. Um, Let's see, when asked, are your own parents more like um, Janine's in modern time or Janine uh, uh, in the game? Um, so, yeah, my, my parents were much more like Janine in the game's foster parents who were kind and wanting what was best for her as opposed to um, um, her real parents who uh, are a little bit... Um, dismissive of her and not being as interested in her maybe as they should be. Although as far as the Janine in the game, my parents are absolutely nothing like the king and queen and my brother was absolutely nothing like any any of her brothers. Um, 
Mo and Jaden asked, who is my favorite character? I refuse to answer that. that that's like asking a mother, which, which of your children is your favorite ch child? Uh, I had a lot of fun with, with all of them, even the, uh, the treacherous ones or the ones that, uh, that you couldn't trust. Um, and what is your favorite part of the first three chapters? Sydney and Jackson asked this. Um, yeah, again, it, it's tough for me to say um, because I spent a lot of time trying to make all of it be fun. Uh, but I do have to say one of the things that was just a tiny, tiny little bit when uh, Janine is in the Rasmussen uh, Gaming Center and she comes across the receptionist who is no help at all, but the receptionist has a uh, mini dragon on her desk. I do like that dragon. Um, the, there goes the cuckoo clock again. Uh, and the dragon is described as having butterfly wings. My daughter, uh, when she went off to college, uh, ended up getting a tattoo, uh, unknown to me until uh, at one point I saw it when she was not planning for me to see it, um, a dragon that, she, so she had this tattoo of a dragon that she designed, which was a dragon with butterfly wings. So I did describe um, my daughter's tattoo as, as this dragon. Okay, did you have any idea when you wrote Heir, Heir Apparent in the early 2000s how close it would be to reality? Uh, that was Janiah. Um, I knew that I wanted it to be one step beyond virtual reality, and I did assume that we would eventually get to a total immersion kind of a game of that sort. I did not expect, um, she, she is described at the beginning as being on this artificial intelligence bus, and there are now cars that are almost like that bus. There isn't public transportation, but there are cars that uh, hardly need a driver and some that don't need a driver at all, even though those are not as common. Um, so those were not things that I anticipated. Uh, do you plan on a sequel? Um, okay, well, I talked to you about how heir apparent, um, and there go the books. Uh, came after user unfriendly um, and so user unfriendly oops user unfriendly was the one that I wrote first then air apparent and there actually is another book deadly pink um, these do not have the same characters actually Janine is a, is a very minor character in um, user unfriendly. She's playing with a group of kids and she's she's one of them. Um, a lot of people that have read both did, do not even notice that. Um, Deadly Pink has totally different characters, a totally different game. Um, what goes, what connects the three books is the fact that um, there is this Rasmussen gaming center and that they have these total immersion kind of games and that something always goes wrong. You would think that the company would finally go out of business for all the lawsuits, for all the things going wrong, um, but so far that hasn't happened. And you can see when, let me do it this way, when I hold up all of the books, why, oops, let's do it this way why the cover was changed. When the third one came out, the uh, people at the publishing company decided that they wanted all three books to look connected. Um, even though, as I said, I really like the, that original cover of uh, Janine holding the sword with the futuristic, like, um, like the Matrix where she's hooked up to the equipment on one side and on the other side, the, the medieval um, look, even though she never actually wears armor, but that gives the impression of um, a fantasy role-playing kind of game. And if you look very, very closely at the cover, what the illustrator has cleverly done, you can kind of see in this area right here, um, the picture becomes pixelated. Um, this is to show that the game is 
falling apart. And I think that that was incredibly clever of the illustrator. Um, and the illustrator is Cliff Nielsen, I believe. Yes. Let's see his name, or, or maybe not. <laughs> I do not have the hang of this camera. Uh, Cliff Nielsen did several of my books, and, and I love them all, but I think that this one um, is absolutely the most brilliant. <clears throat> Has anyone, excuse me, <clears throat> that was Lori, by the way, who asked, um, who asked about the sequel. And um, has anyone ever approached you for a movie? How can we help? Um, Miss Harkins and her students think this is the plot for the most amazing movie. Well, thank you. Um, I have been approached a couple of times um, by people wanting to make movies of my stories, and none of those ever actually worked out. Nobody yet has contacted me about Heir Apparent. If any of you know Steven Spielberg or have his phone number, feel free to call him. I would love to see this made as a movie. Um, what I'm writing, I do have kind of like a movie going through my head. So so I, I think that that would work, but uh, so far no nobody has uh, shown interest. And the last question um, it's from Quentin who asked, do I have any other young adult books written? I'm sorry, that was uh, Cronina and, and Quentin both had asked that. Um, I have written a total of 39 books, um, starting from one picture book um, through middle grade, or early readers through middle grade, through young adult. Um, I have put my web address um, in the description for this video and you can go there and look up my books. They are divided on my website, the picture book, the ones for younger readers and the ones for young adults. Um, so you can go and see the names and see if there's anything there that interests you. Oh, and somebody had asked and I don't see where I answered that question. Um, Well, for my, my goodness, now I can't find it. Here we go. Aaron asked, are the voices Ms. Harkins uses close to how you picture them? I think that her voices are so fun. Um, and, and that's something that I've been very much enjoying. So thank you, uh, Ms. Harkins, for your voices. <laughs> Uh, for sharing the story with your students. Thank you students for all of these wonderful questions. I hope you continue enjoying both the reading and the story. And um, meanwhile, uh, stay safe and be kind to one another. And hopefully I will be talking to you again later when you have more questions. Bye-bye. <laughs>